on the tape. Really? A, a classic sound check. I'm tempted to start asking him all the questions now. <laughs> Okay, okay. Okay. You got pretty face. <laughs> you do. No, really, I like it. talk anytime you want to. Okay. Are you ready, Marissa? Yeah, I'm rolling. Okay. Well, my name is Mark Steinberg, and this Thank afternoon you, we are having a conversation with Yorma Kaukinen. And to start it off, I'd like to ask you uh, some questions about the tour you are currently undertaking. You've been Shoot. touring for quite a few months. You mentioned six months. Uh, I haven't been touring for all this time. I've been away from home. I, I toured for uh, five weeks in the fall. Then I went to Europe. I did two and a half weeks in Italy, and then I've been living in this place in Bavaria. I came back for Christmas, did two and a half, three weeks, and I went back, and I've been out for uh, four or five weeks now. i got two to go. How has the tour been accepted in all, each of these places? How are the yeah, European pretty, shows? For European Christmas? shows are great. Great. What material are you featuring in the set these days? Uh, same stuff I always do. Same stuff. I mean, okay. I mean, I have new songs too, but I do, you know, whatever my current old favorites are. Mm -hmm. So you, do you change it from set to set, or it's yeah, this? pretty much so. Yeah. Great. Uh, the practice of touring has become expensive and almost uh, an archaic practice at that point for most of the electric bands around these days. Did this contribute to the demise of the Vital Parts band? No, uh, I just wasn't really into what was going on. I didn't get along real well with the other guys in the band. We had a lot of different goals and stuff, which is pretty much what that was all about. I should actually point out, though, that even this, though this guitar has a wooden top and a round hole, it is not really an acoustic guitar. I'm using uh, two stacks of high watts and all kinds of fun little gadgets. I've got a pitch transposer and all sorts of toys. Uh, what kind of guitars do you perform with you, since you mentioned uh, that? Oh, ovations is what I'm using right now. Yeah, right now. Uh, I just bought a couple of guitars in, uh, in Kingston, New York, which I'm going to be using probably the next time I come out, which are solid body guitars. Viet Citrone is doing some really innovative stuff. I got a baritone guitar, which is a, a fifth below this. It's kind of halfway between a six-string bass and a guitar. It sounds unbelievable. Big, fat, orchestral sound. And uh, it's easier to process the sound. So if everything works out right, I'll probably be getting away from using these things. But who knows, yeah. I notice you've been changing your strings here. How often do you change your strings? I change them every, every two sets. You do? Yeah. Uh, have you ever wanted the guitar designed and named after you? Uh, no, not really. Because 
Yeah, I guess it would be great if it worked out. I'd love to have a Gibson guitar designed and named after me. I'm sort of traditional in that respect. Other than that, as long as I can get a good guitar, that's all that really matters. Okay. Uh, songs recorded with hot tunas such as Hesitation Blues and the Whining Boy Blues right. were last recorded in the 40s, as far as I know. Were you exposed to this music as a child, or no. was it acquired taste? Uh, I got into it... Uh, well, I, when, I, when I first started listening to guitar music, I just listened to whatever was, was available in Washington, D.C., which was mostly... Uh, it was sort of rhythm and bluesy, because that's the way Washington is. But uh, when I got interested in, in the guitar, I really kind of liked the finger style idea, and I, I went to see a Pete Seeger show once, and he was playing the finger picking at 12 string. I couldn't believe it. Oh, God, it's unbelievable. So I started getting interested in it that way, and I, I wound up going to uh, Antioch College, where there was a bunch of guitar players there, and that's where I really sort of got exposed to the blues. Yeah, right. Well, I got exposed to the blues in Washington, D.C., but it was mostly like Muddy Waters and. and uh, Bo Diddley, Howlin' Wolf, the sort of the, the electric Chicago stuff that was coming out at the time, but Antioch was where I started hearing like fingerstyle guitar players. And I liked the, it a lot. In the old days, uh, 60s specifically, when uh, the airplane were around and uh, you were living in San Francisco, Correct. Uh, there was this incestuous relationship between the bands, you know, CSNY and The Dead. How much did you guys influence each other? Well. Uh, Crosby, I met Crosby a long time before he got in the, in the birds. He, they moved into, by the time they moved into San Francisco, I think that the incestuous relationships were over. From the, from the early days, everybody was playing coffee houses, uh, so everybody just knew everybody. It was a small community, it's not a real big area, the Bay Area, everybody played the same gigs all the time, you just knew everybody. So I think that everybody pretty much had their own specialties, you know, areas of ex expertise, like Jerry was, was pretty much he, he was a real accomplished string musician, but he, what he was doing most of the time was like bluegrass, jug band stuff, mm -hmm. things like that. Pigpen, uh, who played harmonica in, in all the earlier uh, incarnations and uh, later were the dead before he died, was real was a really accomplished blues guitar player, although I never heard him play that with the dead. I saw him do a couple solo shows. He was fantastic. That would have been unbelievable. You've been quoted as saying that you don't live in the past at all, like a lot of people do. Does this reflect uh, your antagonism towards the people who like to uh, stick with your days in the airplane and such? No, not really. It's just a, it's just a fact of life, yeah. I can agree with that, I guess. Uh, Hot Tuna's performances came off sounding very full for what was essentially a three-piece band. Did you right. ever use open tuning? Yeah, sure. For, for the songs I do open tunings in, like, uh, I'm not really an open tuning guitar player, although I do a couple songs in open tunings like Water Song, Police Dog Blues, uh, Hot Jelly Roll Blues, a couple new songs that I've written. So I used, I used to do maybe four or five, at any given time, maybe four or five different songs in, in tunings. Most of the time I just use straight tunings, but mm -hmm. I like to drop the six string to, down a lot. Uh, in the gamut of technology that's been spawning from the 60s to the 80s, is there any, <laughs> hopefully c c continuing, as uh, you gestured there, is there any one gadget that you're particularly grateful for? Well, you, I, I noticed that I kind of tire of gadgets. I, I love electronic gadgets. I was, I was playing down in Baltimore the other night, and there was a, a bunch of guitar players were down there, and some were really offended by a lot of the stuff that I'm doing. I'm telling, hey, you know, I play acoustic guitar in my living room, you know. Uh, when you're playing on stage, I think that uh, you lose you lose a lot of impact by limiting yourself to just playing acoustic guitar. Well, I'm not putting down like, straight acoustic guitar players, and I just really like to play around with technology. Like I just I just got this new thing. It's a pitch transposer, which is a harmonizer, but the MXR thing has four different channels, so you can pre-program all these different intervals with your thing. And it's just a lot of fun to play with. It's it's no substitute for knowing how to play the instrument for mm -hmm. sure, but right. it keeps you from getting bored. Okay, well, with the recent onslaught of 60s material that's been covered by new artists, <laughs> uh, the San Francisco or California bands seem to have been significantly passed over. Do you see any reason for this? Well, probably because the, the popular San Francisco bands of the period made it more in person than they did on, on record. This is my opinion anyway. It had to do with the performance, the interaction of the musicians and stuff like that. And the songs that, that other bands seem to be liking to cover are more like pop music of the era. I don't really classify the San Francisco bands as pop bands, even though a lot of the records did real well. Mm -hmm. uh, there was more to 
more to the music than than just the songs per se. I think the performances tended to stand out more than the compositions. Okay, you mentioned the fact that uh, you weren't into quote unquote what the vital parts were doing and there was some tension between yourselves. Uh, given the limited acceptance with the white gland ban and the mixed <laughs> reviews that were given vital parts, it would seem that the new wave has been dominated by British musicians while the American bands have been passed over. Uh, do you think it'll take uh, uh, another San Francisco era or a similar American renaissance to forge a new path for the American rockers to follow? Well, I think there's a lot of really good American musicians out here. I, I think that traditionally what American musicians have to deal with is is the exoticness of bands from other countries, notably England. And uh, it just tends, people to say, oh, wow, a foreign band, great, you know. And they listen to it and the sound's a little bit different and stuff like that. I think there's a lot of acceptance on the performance level of, of American musicians uh, of all different types all over the country. But I remember uh, in the 60s, you know, bands would come over from England, everybody would go nuts. Oh, shit, the Cream's here. Well, the Cream was a, happened to be a great band, but a lot of other bands came over that weren't so great. Like when Pink Floyd came out, they were the worst band I've ever heard. Now, they metamorphosed into something, you know, much more sophisticated later, but when they, they were horrible when they first came out. You know, Did you but, see them when they first came oh, out? Oh, shit, of course. You know, every, a new band had come, and you go out, and you, I mean, you had to, you know. <laughs> you know these guys getting paid for doing this? Right. Like, really? <laughs> uh, has Vital Parts been permanently disbanded? Yes. Are you continuing, or are you planning, rather, to uh, form another band, or continue to uh, I'd like to solo? do some other band work. Uh, what direction do you think you'll go in? I, I really don't know yet. I'm, uh, hopefully I'm going to start doing some recording at the beginning of the summer. I've got that funny noise you hear leaking through, that's the pitch transposer set in the interval of hold tone fifth. Uh, it's quite loud. <laughs> nothing. Yeah, you haven't seen nothing yet, right? We can't uh, wait. I've got a bunch of new songs, and, I, and I'm not interested in recording them solo. I, I'd like to get the right musicians together. I don't know quite what the format's going to be like. If it works out right, if I get record company support, I'd like to tour with the band. If not, I'm just going to continue playing by myself. On that note, is it more difficult to sell the record companies the idea of a solo album or uh, a solo tour, in effect, rather than a band effort? Well, right now, I'm not with a record company. I just got off RCA, which is, which from my point of view is great, because they really didn't have much idea what to do with me. And uh, my, this, my attorney in New York is trying to work out some deals. I don't think the record companies really care. They just want to sell records, you know. And uh, if I can work out a good deal, and I get some record company support, then I'll, like I say, I'll put a band together and tour with it. Other than that, I just hope to make a good record, and then I'll see what happens. Well, it'll, be, it'll be a band effort then, rather. Well, yeah, it'll be a multi-personnel effort, yeah. Guest appearances, so to speak. So to speak, yes. Uh, elaborate on the thing with the RCA Victor Company. What happened with that? Well, I, I've just been with RCA for, for a decade and a half. Since and, the uh, airplane, right? Right. And I never made any records that lost money. None of them were big sellers in terms of what record companies like to see, but what this means is that they knew that I'd make my record. Like the Barbie King record, we did the whole thing for $32,000, which is nothing for a modern record. And uh, what the record company knew, they'd, I'd do my record, you know, and they'd go out and they'd make their money back a little more, you know, and they wouldn't have to advertise, which they never did. <laughs> um, you yeah. mentioned Vital Parts in uh, the Barbecue King album, uh, the Stench Brothers. Right. If I pronounce their name right, uh, they came Pearl from Street. Pearl Harbor's explosions. Pearl Harbor explosions. Yeah. Uh, what uh, other kinds of things are you listening to these days? Well, I never really listened to Pearl Harbor. I, I met them through this producer I was working with, David Kahn. Uh, both of them are real accomplished musicians, but not. I was never really satisfied with that album, even though it's it's a craftsman-like album, but I, it's not a real soulful album for me. I don't even do any songs off it except for Roads and Roads. Mm -hmm. It just didn't. Touched my heart, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I've been. Uh, Doesn't feel like starting over again, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been listening to a bunch of German bands. Actually, there's a there's this German singer Nina Hagen. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. familiar with sure. her. Sure. The band that used to work with her, Spliff, is has their own record label in Berlin, and they've made a, a bunch of albums. And these guys are fantastic. It does, their music doesn't have too much to do with what they did with her. The guys are really incredible players and. They're real soulful, and they have, their music has a lot of depth, which I like. There's some uh, some other young German bands, like this band called the Marionettes out of out of Munich, that does real new wave-ish kind of stuff, 
Although I, I hesitate to just limit them to that because they can really play anything, you know. I just like to listen to guys who can play good. That's really what gets me on. This one will kill you. Do you still associate with Jack Cassidy? No. Okay. <laughs> or any of the other members of the airplane? No. Haven't. How's Papa John? I run into him occasionally. He's doing great. Good. Still working. Hanging in there, huh? Yeah, for sure. Have you ever done any video recordings? No. Do you have any interest in it? Yeah. You're doing one right now, as a matter of fact. I'd like to do one. I'm going to talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know much about it. I mean, I'm open to suggestions, you know. I think, oh, okay, I think there's more to video work than just taping concerts, you know. So, oh, obviously. Yeah. In terms of promotion. Sure. Or in terms of the, the media itself. Mm -hmm. You've been playing with major groups since the mid-60s. What has it been like performing before an audience for all these years? I love it. I love performing. You going to continue? Yep. Till you drop or what? Probably. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> as long uh, as you will not see me doing Miller beer commercials, I can guarantee you. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys, it's Miller time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any long term goals or have they already been reached? Uh, yeah, I have some more long term goals. I, I'd like to continue what I'm doing. There's other things I like to do too. I, I'm a pretty good photographic technician, I'm interested in that. I'm I also trying to, uh, I'm looking to buy a farm. I'm moving out east this year. I was thinking about upstate New York, although now I'm thinking about Maryland. I'm from down there anyway. I kind of like the area. And uh, I just want to be able to continue what I'm doing. And I consider myself real lucky because I've been able to do basically exactly what I like to do for a long time. And I hope to be able to continue to do that. You mentioned the uh, darkroom hobby, photography. Right. Uh, do you have any other things uh, that you're interested in outside yeah. of music? Uh, I like to build hot rods. I'm selling a 55 Chevy right now. He knows somebody wants to buy one. And uh, I, uh, I shoot competitively when I have time. Oh, I haven't had time for the last year to do that. Bench gun, stuff like that. I, shit, I'm even in the NRA. Do you still live in California? or? Yeah, I own a house there, but I hope to be getting rid of it this year. And you're going to move to New York? Well, either New York or Maryland, somewhere in the East Coast. It doesn't really matter. Everything's so close, you know. Well, at this point, I am just about out of questions. Uh, if there's anything that you'd like to uh, tell an audience at this point. Otherwise, I'd just like to say that it's been an incredibly uh, comfortable situation talking with you. And you've got to fill us in on the continuing saga of your extensive tattoo collection. Uh, I haven't gotten anything new in four or five years. Would you mind giving us a look? We got the video thing here. I hate to. No, I don't do stuff like that. And the, and the reason is I'm not. It has nothing to do with being embarrassed. Like it's very difficult to really reproduce tattoos with any media, and it just really takes a lot of time and the right kind of lights and mm -hmm. this and that and the other sort of thing to do it right. But uh, if you ever get a chance to talk to Ed Hardy, he's the guy that did did my back. He's a he's a real artist. He was an artist before he was a tattooist. And he's, uh, he's the guy to talk to, and I'm sure he'd be happy to just show you tons of stuff. He's got great video work and film clips and stuff that's, that's real impressive. Okay, Yorma Kalkinen, thank you very much. Hey, <laughs>